Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so as Liz has just sort of hinted at in her talk, um, our focus on pterosaurs and sort of the biomechanics is really focused on sort of the upper end of the size estimates uh, of these animals. We haven't really had much to say about the smallest pterosaurs, which are their, their hatchlings, you know, these things that have just come straight out of the egg. This is in part because hatchling pterosaurs are a relatively recent discovery. Um, we've been studying pterosaurs for well over two centuries, but we actually only got the first embryos and hatchlings of these animals uh, in about 2004. And so we now have several specimens of these, uh, of, of embryos or animals which are so small that they've almost certainly just hatched out of the egg relatively recently. Um, and this gives us a, a new insight into not only pterosaur reproduction, but how these animals may have been uh, running around and flying through the air uh, from, the, from the moment they hatched out of the egg. Um, we have enough of these specimens now to draw some very general conclusions. The first is that pterosaur hatchlings were rather small animals. So you see here, this is the, the giant, sorry, not the giant, the three meter wingspan um, filter feeding pterosaur. Uh, pterodaustro. This is the full-size adult, about, as I say, three meter wingspan, about the size of an albatross, a big albatross. And there's its hatchling down here. It's a much smaller animal with a wingspan of somewhere between 25 to 30 centimeters. So it's uh, about the tenth of a wingspan of a, uh, a full-size animal. But if we blew up this uh, hatchling uh, reconstruction here, you take the bones out of the embryo, or you look at the hatchling specimens we have, one thing that is inescapable is how well developed the skeletons of these hatchlings are. So these are not coming out of the eggs with sort of poorly ossified bones or half-formed wings. They actually come out looking pretty much just like their parents. Some of the proportions are a little bit different, but you know, I don't think anyone would deny that this is a very well-developed hatchling. And the development of the wing tissues is very interesting because we don't just see a fully developed wing skeleton, we also see uh, wing membranes preserved in some embryo specimens. So basically, these things are hatching out with fully developed wing anatomy. And that's quite interesting because it suggests that these animals may have been capable of flight from the moment they left the egg, or effectively speaking, the moment they left the egg. And this has given rise to, uh, you may have heard the term flaplings thrown around, this idea that pterosaur hatchlings were flying through the air very early on in life. And this idea has proven very popular. You can see why it's very intuitively, uh, it, it makes sense on a, a lot of intuitive levels. We haven't really looked into it too much yet, but you can certainly see the justification for it just based on a diagram like this alone. However, there are some suggestions that there may be a, a, an alternative take on when pterosaurs took flight. And this alternative take comes from looking at pterosaur growth rates, which we can uh, divide into two main, uh, two main phases. The first is a rapid uh, phase of growth until pterosaurs reach about half their adult size, and then we see a slower growth phase uh, as they go towards their, their maximum size. Typically, we've assumed this is something to do with, as it is in a lot of animals, uh, with reaching uh, somatic maturity and sexual maturity, and a lot of the energy they might be putting into, into growth goes into reproductive processes instead. However, in 2012, Adina Pronvai and colleagues suggested that perhaps this slowing of growth rate is related to the onset of powered flight, which would mean that this early phase of pterosaur growth is a flightless phase, and that what we're actually seeing is, uh, in this slower phase of growth, is a lot of energy being put into powered flight. I mean, this is a, an energy demanding form of locomotion. It, you know, it, it might, might be the case that uh, that's why these animals do slow down in later growth. Uh, so myself, Darren, and Liz, we were quite interested in, in testing this, and we thought we could do this biomechanically. And we came, came up with three hypotheses for how we could uh, interpret uh, hatchling pterosaurs. The first is sort of the null hypothesis, the idea that, uh, that pterosaur hatchlings were capable of flying very early on in life, They're effectively from when they left the egg. So we call that flight first. We have the ground first hypothesis, the, the, uh, this is Adina's idea, where these animals are only taking flight when they reach about 50% of their maximum size. And then we came up with a sort of an intermediate idea, you know, kind of the, the soft Brexit idea, where we have the, the glide first uh, interpretation, which is sort of a middle ground where we say, well, these things clearly have well-developed wings uh, in the eggs, you know, they're clearly hatching out with some sort of flight apparatus. Maybe they can't power their own flight, maybe they can't actually, you know, take off and flap, but perhaps at least they could glide. And so we're calling that glide first. So these are the things that we're, we're looking to investigate here. And to do that, we have two fairly standard tests. I don't want to dwell on the methods too much because these are fairly conventional means of looking into animal flight and biomechanics. So our first test is a simple glide analysis using Colin Pelly Pennycoick's 2008 flight software. This is uh, a widely used um, freeware software that um, 
uh, is, was developed to understand bird flight, but with just a little bit of modification to account for the fact that pterosaurs have membranous wings, you can uh, use it to understand pterosaur flight as well. And so uh, this is based on modifications that Mike Khabib and I made in a 2010 paper. And so we chucked a couple of hatchlings into that, uh, into that flight software to see how well they could glide. And that would give us then some idea of their basic flight performance to see whether they would you know, fall out of the air the moment we kick them out of a tree or something like that. Our second test was to have a look at wing bone strength. This is specifically to get an idea of whether or not these animals could launch. Launch is the most strenuous part of the flight cycle. It's nothing, flapping is obviously fairly strenuous as well, but actually getting into the air is the most strenuous part of the flight cycle. It leaves the biggest signature on an animal skeleton. So what we did is we looked at the bending strength of the humerus. So as many of you may know, the leading hypothesis on how pterosaurs take off is that they launch into the air like certain bats by taking off quadrupedally. So the humerus is one of the main bones taking all of that strain when the animal leaps into the air. And so we looked at the bending strength of the humerus of three hatchling pterosaur specimens and 22 larger pterosaurs that were, everyone's fairly happy that the, they were true powered flyers. The idea being that if the hatchlings could fly, that their uh, bending performance would be comparable or superior to that of the larger flying pterosaurs. And our three hatchling specimens that we sort of used to inform both of these analyses, one, we have the uh, hatchling of a Cretaceous pterodactyloid uh, called Sunupterus dongi, and the second one is the hatchling we've already introduced of, um, of Pterodaustro. We have two, two specimens for, for that, so they're the, the three animals we use there. Just to stress how small these animals are, look at the wingspans here, really tiny little things, really not much bigger than about this. Um, and their masses are, are, are tiny. We're looking at things of, of really just a few grams. Bearing in mind these animals get up to many tens of kilograms or hundreds of kilograms in some cases. These are really tiny little pterosaurs. Now, just for some of our colleagues, they may be wondering where our Sinopterus embryo came from because this is not a, uh, no one has announced the discovery of a Sinopterus. We're interpreting uh, Nemecolopterus uh, crypticus, which is a small, uh, very small pterosaur from China, as a juvenile Sinopterus. Uh, I think there'll be, that might get a few nods of agreement from some pterosaur workers. Other people would not necessarily agree with, agree with us with that. Um, we do have a lot of data supporting this, and our, our manuscript on this will go into this in more detail. I don't want to get sidetracked into that for now. If anyone wants to talk to us about it, uh, by all means, grab us in the coffee break or at lunch. But just to say that that is what our Sinopterus hatchling is based on. It's this animal that's been previously named Nemecolopterus. Okay, so let's move on to some results. Uh, you can see here, this is the results of our glide performance test. Uh, fairly simple graph here. It shows the glide ratio. So this is simply how far an animal will fly uh, sort of horizontally versus how far it will sink through the air. Uh, and the glide ratio is, is just that measurement there. For every meter that the animal sinks, how many meters does it travel? Uh, and you can see there's a range of gliding tetrapods. These are all living gliding tetrapods on the, uh, on the screen here. And here are our hatchling pterosaurs at the top there. This is uh, reflecting the, the range of, uh, of, of our three specimens. And you can see that they can glide extremely well. So if we climbed up a 10 meter tall tree and we threw all of these animals out of the tree, our hatchling pterosaurs would sail forward for about 130 meters or something like that. You know, they are very, uh, very well developed gliders. There's no doubt about that. Um, what is interesting is that when running this analysis, we have to obviously model aspects of pterosaur wing shape and uh, pterosaur wing ecomorphology. And we noticed how long and narrow the wings of hatchling gliders were compared to all of our living gliders. Living gliders tend to have rather short, low aspect wings. Aspect ratio is about two. Our hatchling pterosaurs have um, aspect ratios of about six. So they are very long, narrow wings compared to those of living gliders. They compare much better to those of modern powered flyers. So that suggests to us that that's, that's already a bit of an indication that they're sort of over adapted for gliding. And one, certainly one in, uh, one conclusion we can, I think we can already make provisionally is that the ground first hypothesis must be unlikely just on this basis. These wings are so well developed for some sort of gliding flight that this doesn't seem, doesn't seem likely that they were completely flightless uh, even, even as hatchlings. They must be able to glide a little at least. And the plot thickens really when we start to look at our bone strength analysis. So um, here, all the blue dots here are our 22 uh, non-hatchling specimens. Um, up the, up the y-axis here, we have relative failure force of the humerus. So this is the bending strength of the humerus divided by the body weight. How many, how many body weights of these pterosaurs could you hang off the edge of the humerus before it snaps? 
Um, and this is a way of, of comparing things, you know, this big compared to things which are, uh, you know, withstand the size of this, uh, of, of this room. So it means we don't, don't lose out too much data to scaling. Um, and you can see that the, the hatchlings are up there. They're the black dots. And they are extremely strong for their body weight. These animals have got extremely strong humeri uh, relative to their, to, their, their, to their body mass. They're actually comparable to the strongest non-hatchling humeri that we modeled. And this comes from a specialist insect chasing pterosaur, so anurognathids. They seem to have very, very strong wings. Uh, so it's not, uh, not surprising that we've got this very high uh, bending strength in anurognathids. But what's, what's more interesting is that our hatchlings are so strong as well. Um, We've just had a really excellent primer on uh, pterosaur bone wall thicknesses from Liz, so hopefully this graph will make a lot more sense because of her talk. Uh, we've got all the RT values plotted out for our different, uh, different specimens here. And the reason that hatchling pterosaur humeri are so, are so strong is because they are essentially <coughs> miniature pterosaur humeri in every sense of the word. I mean, if you have a look at the skeleton here, you can see how big and robust they are as a component of the wing skeleton. And if you chop one in half, you can see they have the sort of the, the stereotyped high RT value of a pterosaur wing. And they have those properties with the advantage of weighing next to nothing. So they have this very strong uh, wing skeleton combined with a very low body mass, and that means they could probably really throw themselves around without damaging their wings or putting their, ring, their wings at risk of, uh, of, of bending. So put all these things together, we have a very strong glide performance. We have uh, a wing shape more consistent with those of powered flyers. We have um, wing skeletal strength, which is uh, better than most other pterosaurs in our analysis. And we have these uh, sort of this classic uh, bending resistant pterosaur wing construction in these animals. And we think that functionally speaking, biomechanically speaking, uh, all indications are that these animals were ready for powered flight. Now, we're not saying that they definitely were powered flyers, but we're saying that everything that we've tested in this uh, indicates that they were certainly capable of, um, of, of, of flying. You know, there was nothing wrong with their wings, nothing wrong with their skeletons to suggest they couldn't fly. Um, but that doesn't mean that they flew like their parents. And one interesting thing to come out of this is that it's really got us thinking about what is it like to be flying as a hatchling compared to be uh, to, to be flying as a large adult pterosaur. As we've already touched on, these animals do increase in size quite a lot as they grow. And we know from just simple scaling of flying objects, you know, this can be a plane or it can be a bird, it can be a bat, whatever it is, that there are inescapable uh, consequences of scaling when it comes to being uh, a, a flying object. Uh, your wing loading increases, your flight speed and glide ratios increase, so you become a better glider, uh, but you do start, to, uh, do start to sacrifice some other aspects of, um, of your wing morphology, such as your skeletal strength and your maneuverability. So, as I say, these are inescapable consequences of scaling, and we have to bear in mind how much scaling goes on when, within one pterosaur species. So, in the animals we have assessed in our, thank you, in the animals we've assessed in our, um, in our study, you can see the mass differentials in the pterosaurs are really tremendous, hundreds of times mass differences in these animals, and so. We conclude that these things could not be flying in the same way as juveniles as they were as adults. There must have been some differences in this. And so one conclusion um, to take is that if we're trying to understand the flight of these animals, we can't just say Pterodaustro flew like this. We have to say Pterodaustro flew like this as an adult, but it may have flown in a different way as a juvenile. And we wonder, is there some potential for pterosaurs to have exploited this ecologically? Um, was this something that they just tried to compensate for throughout their life and they tried to live the same lifestyle throughout their entire life? Or did they just say, you know what, as a juvenile, I am much better suited to slow, maneuverable flight. And as they grow into adults, they are capable of doing more and more things with their flight or different things, I should say, which are better suited to different environments, different habitats and different behaviors. Uh, we don't have the answers to that at the minute but there are lots of things we could look at to get some, uh, to, to, to understand that. We need to start looking, I think, at pterosaurs more, uh, really get a grip of their, how functionality and ontogeny are related. Things like understanding their skeletal allometry, looking at differences in tooth wear between juveniles and adults, and looking for biases in pterosaur samples like we see in Tranodon. We've not got a, we have one juvenile Tranodon specimen out of a thousand known specimens, otherwise they're all sub-adults and adults. And that suggests they are living in a different place to the, to the, to, the, um, to the juveniles, that might reflect something to do with their flight, something to do with changing uh, niches and, uh, sorry, with ont something to reflect ontogenetic niches as they, uh, as, as they grow. So, um, 
and that's really it. I think we've, so to, to, to summarize then, uh, everything that we tested biomechanically about hatchling pterosaurs suggests that they uh, support the flight first models. We see a lot of dynamism in pterosaur body scaling, and we need to understand uh, what flight scaling means for pterosaurs with, uh, with regard to their ecology and behavior, but that needs to be part of the bigger picture in terms of understanding pterosaur ontogenetic niching and the more integrated approaches into the functionalities of these animals in general. And I think that's me done. So thanks for listening. <laughs>